Yes. Can oh, you? hello, I'm here. Oh. Yeah, okay. So do you, are you gonna keep your video off then? I, I can turn it on. Okay, we are live. Can everyone hear me? All right. Okay, we're gonna get started everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us again for another media briefing. Today is April 1st. Today we will have statements from Acting Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Shu Li Wong, uh, Regional Chair Karen Redmond, and Region of Waterloo CAO Mike Murray. Um, as always, we will listen to the statements and uh, when they're done, I will call on media to ask their questions. So just a reminder to keep yourself muted uh, until it's your turn to ask questions. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Shu Li. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, so I'll start my update um, by letting you know that uh, sadly, we have just received confirmation of our second death from COVID-19 in Waterloo Region. Uh, the patient was a male in his 50s with a pre-existing condition and was in hospital at St. Mary's General Hospital. This is an especially difficult time for the family and loved ones. And I wish to express my deepest condolences to them. I'll now go on to reporting the overall picture uh, for Waterloo Region. So as of this morning, um, as uh, you likely have seen, we have a new dashboard to illustrate in visual form the, uh, the data that we're collecting with respect to COVID-19 in our region. And uh, with this new dashboard, we hope to better illustrate the trends in our community. Uh, we are now able, for example, to provide a picture of the epi curve for our community and not just the, the total number of cumulative cases. It provides a a better sense of when cases are coming in uh, in our community. Um, so in total, we now have 117 cases in Waterloo Region. Uh, of that total, 21 are currently in hospital. You also see uh, new statistics now for patients ever in hospital and patients ever in ICU. Um, so you'll see that 17 of the total 117 have ever received treatment in ICU. This doesn't mean they're all currently in ICU. It is too difficult to track ICU status at any one time as people can move in and out of ICU. What this tells you though, is that there are a number of cases in the region who have ever been in, in ICU and it tells you that number. Um, we are also now tracking the total number who have ever been hospitalized, even if they are no longer in hospital. So you will see that on the dashboard as well. Uh, the total number we tested in the region is now 1,915. Of that number, 1,329 have been confirmed negative. We are awaiting test results on 469 individuals, and we are monitoring 570 individuals and 15 cases are now resolved. And to date, we have had two deaths in the region. One last update about cases uh, is that the Chief Medical Officer of Health has now issued a directive for long-term care homes and retirement homes across Ontario, such that once they have one case in either a patient or a staff member, they are to be declared in outbreak. As a result, we have two outbreaks, both declared last night, one at Sunnyside Home, where one staff member has tested positive, and one at Highview Residences KW, where two residents have tested positive. And uh, we'll continue to keep our, um, our list of outbreaks updated on our new dashboard. Um, next, I'd like to just provide some, some more information regarding essential reasons to leave your home. So there have been questions about what constitutes an essential 
reason. And um, the Chief Medical Officer of Health has provided updated guidance on what is considered an essential reason for leaving your home if you are not otherwise required to do so for work as part of an essential or critical service. Um, so we recommend that you stay at home and limit the number of trips that you make into the community, unless it's for essential reasons. And essential trips would include accessing healthcare services, shopping for groceries, picking up medication at the pharmacy, walking pets when required, and supporting vulnerable community members with meeting the above needs. And if you must go out for any of these reasons, please keep two meters between yourself and others. And in closing, I'd like to say, um, although we do know that uh, groups of people such as older adults and those who do have other medical conditions are at greater risk, uh, no one is immune to the development of infection, nor the possibility of serious complications and death. We need to continue working together to further slow the spread of infection. As I mentioned last time, I know many have endured difficulties and have had to sacrifice because of the many restrictions and closures. We need to support one another and those who are making those sacrifices by each contributing to doing what we can to slow the spread of the virus. Every time someone complies with the recommendations or the orders with respect to not gathering, staying at home unless you need to go out and physical distancing when you are out, you can help prevent somebody from getting critically ill or worse. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wong. So now we're gonna turn it over to Regional Chair Karen Redman. Go ahead, Karen. Thanks, Bethany. We are deeply saddened to hear that a 41-year-old male resident of our community lost his life to COVID-19 yesterday, as well as a second male in his 50s today. I offer help, heart, heart, heartfelt condolences to their families and loved ones. And I know they are in our thoughts of all the residents of Waterloo Region at this difficult time. Our thoughts are also with the staff of St. Mary's Hospital who cared for these patients and who continue to care for other critically ill patients as we work to stop the spread of COVID-19. This is sad news. It's a sobering reminder that we must all keep making efforts to reduce the spread of this virus and continue to adhere to the preventative measures in place that are being promoted by public health. I would like to thank all of you across the region who are doing everything you can to control the spread. It is having an impact, but we have to keep working to make sure we get through this together. Remember to stay home as much as possible Practice physical distancing, self-isolation, work from home, avoid gatherings, and wash your hands and wash them often. These measures are what we need, but we need to keep doing them. We are a caring community. I hear stories every day about residents who are doing whatever they can to help each other. So I'm asking you to help others. I'm asking you to follow the public health guidelines to flatten this curve we can do this together. In the spirit of being a caring community, which is something Waterloo Region is known for, I'm asking you to consider our local charities who are also struggling in this challenging time. The need for charitable services are high, yet donations will undoubtedly go down to the, um, due to the current employment impacts. If you can give, please give. For example, the Food Bank of Waterloo Region and the Cambridge Self-Help Food Bank are accepting donations online at www.foodassistancenetwork.ca. They're ensuring that food can be delivered to those who need it during this COVID-19. Thank you for being a community that is demonstrating that we will leave no one behind. Thank you, Karen. And our final speaker, I'll turn it over to CAO Mike Murray. Great, thanks, Bethany. Uh, so I'll provide um, brief updates on two things. One is um, the extension of closures to the public of regional and area municipal facilities. 
And then secondly, a really quick update on emergency childcare. So uh, this morning, uh, the region and all our municipalities announced that we were, we are extending the closure to the public of our facilities until May the 4th. So this follows on the heels of two announcements by the province earlier this week. On Monday, the province announced they were extending the state of emergency uh, to mid-April. And then yesterday, the Minister of Education announced extending school closures until May 4th. Um, so the provincial action was the impetus early on for the region uh, and the area municipalities closing their facilities. And so with the recent announcement by the province of extending the state of emergency and extending school closures, um, we thought it was the right and prudent decision to extend the closure, uh, closure of regional facilities to the public until May the 4th. Um, the province also announced um, closures of a number of other facilities um, and amenities, and that was all included in a media release earlier today. So that's um, extension of closures. The other thing I want to provide a really brief update on is uh, emergency childcare. As we've talked about a couple of times, um, there is provision now for emergency childcare for children of people in critical positions. The province has a list of uh, what those roles are, so what families uh, are eligible. Um, and uh, I'm happy to say that uh, tomorrow, um, two of our child care centers will be opening uh, to provide emergency child care for eligible um, uh, children of eligible families. Um, if people are looking for more information about that program, they can find it um, at the region's website, regionofwaterloo.ca slash community supports COVID-19. And there, there is a link to an online um, application process uh, that, that's relatively straightforward. So those are uh, my two quick updates and uh, I think we'll turn it back to Bethany and we'll all um, be available for questions. You're Thank you. I had muted myself. I have children in the house. Okay, so we're gonna take media questions now. Um, I'm just gonna change my view so I can see everyone and I'm gonna throw it first to Kate from CBC. There we go. Hello. Um, We've talked uh, in previous media briefings about people who are homeless and, and Chair Redmond, you just mentioned homeless, uh, the food bank as another area that needs sort of additional funding um, and donations if people can. But what about people who are on Ontario Works or ODSP who might be feeling really kind of stressed at this time? Is there anything public health or, or the region can offer to them in terms of advice when you know they can't stockpile a little bit of extra food or they can't maybe get out as much as they would like to, or they're worried about getting out, especially if they have a disability. Yep. Um, so, so I could provide a couple of comments. Um, so one is uh, people on um, Ontario Works, uh, the last day or two was uh, check day. And so I'm happy to say that we put in place provisions to make sure that all of our OW recipients receive their payments on time. Uh, so that, you know, took a significant amount of work to make sure we can, you know, maintain social distancing and yet make sure uh, these people who, you know, really need this assistance are able to get it. So that, you know, I think was, um, you know, particularly important for them. That does relief a little bit of the stress when they actually get their monthly check on time. Um, many of them are in contact with their, uh, with their case aides and case workers. And I think they have resources that they're able to provide um, the community supports group that we've talked about a couple of times. Also, um, uh, there is a, a psychosocial and spiritual uh, support group as part of that, and they're creating online resources that are also accessible through uh, that same page, um, regionofwaterloo.ca uh, slash community supports COVID-19. So there's some resources there now, and there will be more as that group uh, gets more active. Hope and that helps. And, and I think Kate, Sir Redmond wanted to add. Kate, if I if I can just add, um, you know, there there were advertisements through social media and public service announcements to the general public saying, we know the public health is saying we shouldn't be going out to buy groceries on a daily basis. And if people could restrain from going out in those two or three days around when social service recipients were getting their checks, they could ensure that there was stock on the shelves for them when they went to buy their groceries because 
unlike the rest of us, they may not be able to buy ahead as much as we have who have financial resources. So I thought that was a really good way to empower the public to allow people who um, are already worried about um, uncertain food supplies and maybe money a little bit more than the rest of us that they could help contribute to their well-being. Thanks, Karen. Uh, Kate, do you have uh, any other questions? Yeah, um, just one more for Dr. Wong. Um, we've kind of talked about it before about the idea of flattening the curve and we did see, we only went up by, it was 103 now, it's 117 cases um, since Monday. Is that a good sign to you? Do you think that's a sign of something or do you think it's just, um, just another number and we're gonna continue to see things go steep up? Oh, sorry, I muted myself. Um, so that's a that's a great question, Kate. And in fact, uh, that's one of the reasons that we produced that new graph, the first graph on our dashboard, which is the epi curve, um, because it illustrates much better the speed at which we're getting new cases, right? Um, and so we can see with that graph that it doesn't seem to be continually, you know, doubling or or, or or exponentially increasing. Oh, I'm, just, sorry, I'm just gonna. Um, so, so that's a good sign. I still think it's too early to tell. I, I, I still think that even though you know this is looking like it's good in the sense that we're not exponentially increasing, uh, it's too early to tell, and it will be critically important for our entire community to keep up these. I'm sorry to keep up these measures for the next weeks. I can't say at this time when they need to stop keeping up these measures, but we need to pre prepare ourselves for having to continue this for the next weeks. Okay, Bethany, those are my questions. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Kate. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Nicole at CTV. Um, are you ready for your questions, Nicole? Yep. Um, so question number one, um, in regards to the latest death, um, I heard 60s and then I heard 50s. Can you just clarify um, what age group and when he passed away? Um, we're, we're just getting that <laughs> some of this information, um, you know, sort of now. So what we have is what we have to date is that this was a male in his 50s. Um, and um, we were informed this morning um, that he passed away. So it's possible he passed away before this morning, but we were informed this morning. Okay, um, thank you for that. Um, now, the information um, says that there have been 17 people who were hospitalized or in ICU. I, I, you know, are you able to say how many are still in ICU and? Are of the 17 people, were any of them on ventilators? Um, so we can't say at any one time how many uh, are in ICU because it fluctuates so quickly or can fluctuate so quickly. But with the statistics, you can see how many are of our cases have ever needed ICU, even if it was just for one, one period of time. Um, so, you know, usually ICU involves intensive care, um, you know, and so. I can't specify how many are on ventilators at any one time, but what we have is what we have. It does, I think what it shows is that, you know, there can be a, a certain percentage, there, there, there is a percentage of cases which require not only hospitalized care, but intensive care. And so it, I think, again, points to, you know, the seriousness of COVID-19. Okay, um, and my last question, um, an inmate has tested positive at Grand Valley Institution. Mm -hmm. Is that case along with other tests that are being done there captured in the numbers released by the region? Um, so um, cases uh, that, are, that are within the federal uh, prison are, are managed by them. And um, I'd have to get back to you actually about whether they're counted in our cases. I, I just know that they are managing their cases and um, it's it's not the, the local health unit, but I, I'd have to ask 
my staff and then get back to you about whether that particular case is in our count or not. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Nicole, for your questions. I'll turn it over to Kevin from Global. Can you hear us, Kevin? Sure. Uh, my set, my question is similar to Kate in that, um, I mean, now today it was sort of announced that everything's closed till May 30th, which is another month of, sort of or sorry, May, early May, uh, another month of asking people to sort of stay inside. Um, is there what, is there evidence that this has been effective so far? Yeah, well, the evidence that we're seeing from other jurisdictions, as well as the evidence that we're actually seeing in Canada and Ontario to date, is uh, suggesting that this is effective. And uh, what we know, you know, from other jurisdictions is that it has had a significant impact when when they have implemented such measures. So I I believe it is the most effective measure that we have now given the state that we're in, which is that we have community transmission of COVID-19. This is the most effective measure. And it, of course, washing your hands and staying home if you're ill are, are critically important as well. But, but as a community, maintaining social distancing and staying at home when you don't have to go out, those are the most important things that we need to do as a community. I believe in its effectiveness, yes. Thanks, Julie. No further no questions problem. from you, Kevin? No. Okay, great. I'm going to turn it over to Joanna from the record. Are you ready, Joanna? Yeah, thank you. Uh, just a question about masks. I know the local recommendation is that um, sort of the general public, if they're healthy, they don't need to be wearing masks. But other places are now saying that people should wear masks regardless if they're going out into the public. Is that changing here or what's your recommendation now? Oh, thanks for your question. So um, for those types of questions, we do rely on federal and provincial experts who have the expert bodies who we, we understand are continually assessing the evidence on this, including some of the studies that people have been reporting. So they have the expertise at those levels to assess the, the evidence and then determine from that what would be the best recommendations for our community. So we're gonna to continue to follow uh, that guidance and recommend what they recommend uh, for Canadians. And can you just state briefly what those are then for masks? Yeah. So what we recommend is for people that are having symptoms and or have been told by their healthcare provider to wear masks. Yes, masks uh, are or can be effective in those situations. For people who do not have symptoms, um, you know, we're not recommending that these people go around wearing masks. The other thing we have to remember is that in Ontario, like in the rest of Canada, we have a very limited supply of uh, per personal protective equipment compared to uh, what I mean by very limited is very limited compared to the demand that could exist out there uh, from anyone that might want masks, right? So we have to make sure that our use of personal protective equipment is as judicious as possible and reserved for, for those uh, patients and healthcare workers that need it the most. So uh, that's another reason why uh, we need to ensure that not only we follow the, the best evidence of the experts, but that in the meantime, we continue to, ex to, to exercise the most judicious use of masks that we can. Thanks. Thank you. Is that it for your questions, Joanna? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I'm just going to check that I haven't missed anyone. Um, if anyone has any final questions, uh, can you speak up? If not, I think that that's probably it. So, you know, once again, thanks to our media partners for, you know, really helping us share this important information with the community under really challenging circumstances. And we will do this again on Friday. So thanks again. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye guys. <laughs>